Uh, let's uh, turn over to uh, Ken Wang. Uh, Thank you uh, Ken much. is professor of uh, medicine at the Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester, uh, Minnesota. He is our past president of the ISDE as well as of the American Society for Gastrointestinal uh, Endoscopy. And it's uh, impossible to talk about Barrett's esophagus without having uh, Ken on board. So Ken, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you as well as to have you discuss the role of surveillance. Thank you. There's my disclosures on the screen. Uh, and so these are the goals for my talk today. It's indeed an honor to be on a panel with such prominent people like uh, yourself and uh, George and uh, Shachiro. My goals are to talk about surveillance after endoscopic resection, current recommendations for surveillance after esophagectomy, and the knowledge gaps that we have about post-resection surveillance. And I think that's probably going to be the most important thing. I'm going to do this case-based with a 64-year-old gentleman with dysphagia to solids alone for the last two months, obviously alarm symptom, history of GERD since he was 14, good relief with over-the-counter uh, H2 receptor antagonists and proton pump inhibitors. However, this individual is a 35-pack year smoker, chronic bronchitis, uses nocturnal oxygen, has vascular disease, coronary artery disease, and two stents were placed three months ago, and he's on anticoagulants with aspirin and pilots. Uh, this is actually fairly common in our population in the States. This is what we found, a kind of a large uh, uh, polypoid uh, uh, lesion at the junction that we uh, investigated. You can see it is lumen obstructing uh, when you look in the retroflex view, but pretty much as a junctional cancer, like a seaward two. EUS of the lesion, you can see muscular layer, potential invasion uh, passed into the muscularis propria. It was classified as a T2 lesion. Ordinarily, these cases, as George pointed out, go straight to surgery, but uh, surgery actually uh, declined to operate as the patient could not walk six feet without getting short of breath, and the FEV1 was less than 0.8. So uh, surgery deemed him very high risk, and uh, we were asked to see what we could do. Uh, the CT PET scan demonstrated no evidence of metastases, we did what Sachiro suggested. I did a uh, endoscopic submucosal dissection using a clip traction uh, with dental floss. It's, uh, we are now uh, have adopted that into our regimen. And it turned out to be a grade two adenocarcinoma with submucosal invasion, but no lymphovascular involvement. And it was an R0 resection. So, at this point, this is going to be my poll question. Uh, what would you do to follow this patient? Well, one can argue that uh, you know he's not a surgical candidate, so should you even bother? But he is a candidate for chemotherapy and radiation. The oncologists actually made that uh, point. So what would you do to look for recurrence? These are your options. Let's uh, do the poll question. And you can select one of those four choices. Wow, I think there's more surgeons uh, on this call than uh, gastroenterologist, but endoscopy seems to be winning. Uh, and to be honest with you, uh, I will now review what the guidelines say to do, uh, which is quite interesting. Thank you all very much. Uh, there's a few more are still coming in, but I, it's pretty clear endoscopy is going to uh, uh, be the ruling factor here. Being a gastroenterologist, we all appreciate the business. 
So I went and looked for, are there guidelines that actually cover this topic? And there are surprisingly few that really specify what happens when you do endoscopic submucosal resection. There's the Japanese esophageal cancer practice guideline from 2017, but that was actually published just last year in 2019. And the first author was the past president of the ISDE, Dr. Kitagawa. Anyhow, being his comprehensive self, he governed that if you did ESD, as in this case, he would suggest doing EGD every three to six months for a year after resection. And he pointed out that lymph node metastases usually occur uh, sometime around year two to three. And after that first year, they would then advise doing CT and EUS imaging. Now, if you did an EMR, you know, it sounded like there would be a need to do a little tighter uh, uh, follow-up. Every four months was recommended because of the higher rate of recurrence that Shichiro pointed out for three years and uh, doing CT scans at the same time. Now, this is all based on consensus expert opinion. There isn't really uh, evidence-based data to show one regimen is better than another or we should be doing this three or four months or six months. Uh, that data doesn't seem to exist but uh, these were the recommendations. Now, if you did esophagectomy to look for recurrences, this pointed out that most recurrences occur within the first two years. And uh, the recommendation was to do EGD CT scans every three months for the first two years, very tight follow-up. And then EGD and CT every six months afterwards for years three to five, and then for years five to 10, yearly EGD or CTs. But it was, this was the recommendation, but it was noted that there is no prescribed interval or surveillance method that actually has been proven to, be, to uh, increase longevity or allow earlier detection of disease. Now, one other thing that you might think about, like in this case, if we hadn't have done an endoscopic resection, could you have done definitive chemo radiation? And if you did, and there was complete responses, they noted recurrences were usually year one to two, and what they recommended was similar to resection, EGD and CT every three months for years one to three, and then EGD and CT every six to 12 months, in years three to five, but also recommending follow-up for complications. Now, it's important to note these guidelines were really written for squamous cell cancers and not for the topic today, Barrett's early cancers. But uh, this was a fairly definitive uh, guideline. Now, if you look at US guidelines, uh, like uh, this one that was written in the NCCN, published in a journal, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. All patients should be followed systematically is the recommendation. However, what is unclear is surveillance strategies are controversial. So there is no firm recommendation on what you have to do. What was recommended in the NCCN was complete history and physicals every three to six months for year one and two, and every six to 12 months for year three or five, and then annually. And what was recommended was really blood counts, chemistry profiles, upper GI endoscopy with biopsies, and imaging studies should be performed as clinically indicated. So really, they didn't come out because it was controversial and say what should be done, they just said, well, whatever seemed to be most appropriate. And then the European guideline, which uh, just looked at the data, this is an old uh, uh, publication, but it's the one that's still governing. There is no evidence that regular follow-up after initial therapy influences the outcome. So on that basis, they really just uh, said, well, you know, whether or not you follow, what difference does it make? 
Well, one thing to keep in mind, like I pointed out, we're talking about adenocarcinomas, but a lot of the guidelines were written for squamous cell cancers, not the NCCN, obviously, but uh, certainly the Japanese society. And cancers of the uh, squamous cell cancers definitely have a worse prognosis than adenocarcinomas. Now, this happens to be a study from Japan. You can kind of see that uh, there are much fewer adenocarcinomas. As Shachir was pointing out, you know, his 9% of, uh, of uh, cancers being adenos is dead on with this publication. These were all superficial cancers. But if you look at disease-free survival, it's not very high with the squamous cell cancers, uh, hovering on 50%, whereas adenocarcinomas are better than 80%. Which is, uh, you know, then the recurrence rates you can see kind of mirror this. So really, uh, we don't have great guidance for adenocarcinomas. A lot of the careful follow-up being done for squamous cells perhaps don't apply as much to adenocarcinomas. Uh, this was uh, one of the uh, publications for once again squamous cell cancers. And uh, as pointed out in Dr. Kitagawa's article, uh, recurrences usually within a year, two to three years have been reported. And you can see off comes the EMR ESD every three months endoscopy, and then six months after around a year. They did throw in, in this publication, screening by otolaryngologist, which obviously isn't a bad idea and isn't something that we routinely do in the States, but something to contemplate because I have found squamous cell cancers reoccurring, especially in the oral pharynx uh, in these patients. And it was recommended that this, this be done with Lugol solution and otolaryngology every year. So risk of recurrence after ESD, as was pointed out by Shichiro, if this is done properly, everything's taken out very few local recurrences in this particular study and 1.4% distant recurrences. So overall, not bad results from uh, uh, ESD and, and there was a recommendation just to do a uh, watchful waiting. Uh, the AGA clinical practice uh, got uh, a document that was published uh, that looked at the use of ESD in esophageal cancer obviously shows once again what the differences are uh, with uh, depth of invasion and later metastasis. And you can see uh, squamous cell cancers definitely are worse until you hit about SM3 level, then the uh, risk of METs is about the same. And on the left column, you can see all of the factors that play into potential metastases, those, uh, all those uh, things that we think about with early cancers. So can surveillance actually find treatable disease with recurrence? And th this is a good question. And there was 160, 611 patients that underwent ESD of the uh, basically squamous cell cancers. All were treated with ESDs. Only five were recurrent. But the important point is, it's interesting, that despite careful surveillance like we saw was recommended in Japan, most of the recurrent lesions were larger than the originals, 22 millimeters versus 11, and much larger resections were required. So certainly, if you're doing surveillance of this, everybody should be very well trained to do fairly large scale ESDs. I think there's very important knowledge gaps that we need to address. And I think that the ISDE should take the first step in this and issue a white paper to recommend a follow-up interval after curative esophageal cancer therapy in adenocarcinomas. There's really a lack of good documented methods to undertake. It'd be best if we could actually do a study and dress the the uh, surveillance methods and the recommended intervals, given the risk of recurrences is not high, it would need to be a very large international study and some, something certainly the society could do. So in summary, there's no uniform strategy currently recommended for surveillance. And the, from the Japanese uh, society, EGD is CT scans every three months for the first 
two years seems to be a reasonable recommendation to follow in the absence of others. Uh, after endoscopic resection, uh, it's every three to six months and every six months with CT scans in years two and three. And finally, uh, we have a large knowledge gap here for post-resection surveillance. And we only have expert opinion and a few retrospective cohort studies. I think this is a good uh, area that the ISDE can do some prospective studies on or at the least issue a white paper summarizing the state of the field and our recommendation. Thank you. I'm open for questions. Okay, Ken, thank you very much. Uh, very clear information about it. So uh, while we're waiting for some of the questions there, Ken, can, can you tell us what, what's your practice? Uh, because you, know, you do a lot of resections, EMR, ESD, uh, both for high grade as well as for, uh, you know, cancer. It, it, do you take a different approach for surveillance uh, post endoscopic therapy for high grade cancer, high grade dysplasia versus T1A versus T1B that you have treated endoscopically? What's your approach? Well, actually, you know, just empirically, we've kind of uh, followed uh, the uh, Japanese recommendations, we usually follow these patients every three months. We don't do CT scans on them uh, every three months. Usually, you know, for these high risk lesions, T1B, poorly differentiated, the vast majority, the reason they're seeing us is they weren't surgical candidates or they refused surgery in the first place. So, you know, we usually look for local reoccurrences to treat what we can treat. If they become symptomatic or develop obvious other metastases, then we will refer for chemo radiation. But, uh, you know, most of these patients, as you're well familiar with, are very old and frail. And our goal, even if it's not curative, is to try to give them the best quality of life possible for the longest time possible. Got you. So you don't differentiate between high-grade dysplasia and cancer. Everyone gets surveillance every three months. Yeah, I think, you know, Sheila can comment. You know, I think the differentiation between high-grade dysplasia and early T1A cancer is pretty thin because as many, many studies have shown, genomically, they are about the same. They all contain high degree of genomic instability. And I think, you know, we get a lot of recurrences after high grade dysplasia uh, ablation. And by the way, I wanted to point out, that's one of the really nice things, Sachiro, that you have in Japan that we don't have. You don't have RFA. So what we have is a lot of patients, almost all the cancers we get to treat have been previously treated with radiofrequency ablation, which leads to intense submucosal fibrosis, making the dissections just awful. Uh, I think you know that's one of the lessons in Japan that they've taught well, which is don't monkey with a lesion if you think it needs to be resected. And uh, fibrosis in the United States in the submucosa is routine with any of our procedures. It uh, makes things very, very difficult. Good, good point, Ken. Good point, I think. So the lesson learned is if you're wanting to resect, don't biopsy it, don't ablate it, don't do anything with it to do that. If I can have Sachiro and George <coughs> turn on their cameras as well, uh, it's uh, 7.22 here. So we have about uh, five minutes for uh, uh, you know a good panel discussion and maybe... I'll, I'll start off with, uh, you know, a case which, uh, you know, involves input from, so this is almost like having an MDT here uh, with Sheila sort of uh, t telling us about uh, the genomics of it. And then George, Shichiro and Ken, you know, battling over endoscopic therapy versus surgery. So uh, uh, first, uh, Ken and Shichiro, your just very brief sort of answers. Uh, uh, Ken, uh, you, you have a patient with a C2 M6 Barrett's esophagus. There is a three centimeter 
uh, you know, visible lesion, which is a Paris 2A lesion, uh, which endoscopically does not appear to have any signs uh, of uh, deep invasion endoscopically. Uh, the question for you, again, just short answers. Uh, the options are piecemeal EMR, number two is ESD, number three is uh, surgery. So uh, Ken, we'll start off with you. Which one of those options? Yeah, I would uh, definitely go with uh, ESD. Uh, I think, you know, piecemeal resection is going to have a higher rate of recurrence. And uh, the first endoscopic approach, you have to do the best possible one. Okay, Sachiro. So Yes, I totally agree, with, uh, Professor Wang. I would select the ESD because the umbrella resection is essential. And if you do piecemeal resection, you must miss the opportunity to identify the minute submucosal invasion, the risk of lymph metastasis, a lymph vascular invasion. You must miss if you do piecemeal resection. So George, let's go to you and uh, tell uh, these two guys that they're wrong and that you want to take the patient for an esophagectomy, please. Actually, I agree with them. ESD is the best for the patient. I, I think that will be better. Sheila, the data from Europe says otherwise, and uh, they've had as good results, if not better results with piecemeal EMR. So Sheila, so, what do you say? So yes, the, the point is not, not all centers can do an ESD, right? You need, we really need experts who are trained in doing this, this very complex procedures. And, and indeed, we, we have data. If you do an EMR, uh, uh, piecemeal EMR, and you do it in a, in a good way, right? You, you remove the whole uh, lesion in one session, then we do have uh, very nice outcomes. Uh, the outcomes that were shown today were different than the outcomes we see in, in, in several other centers uh, for piecemeal EMR. You, you, you know, uh, Ken, you just gave a beautiful presentation about the follow-up and the surveillance uh, of these sort of cases and what, what you're talking about, critique, and also the decision-making of uh, do we go a piecemeal EMR or do we go uh, um, ESD? And we didn't speak about biomarkers. That was not a topic of today, but I know Ken is very busy in this field. Uh, you've shown us something about artificial intelligence. It's going to be a new biomarker for us. And I think that will be helpful to decide what to do with these patients. You know, better to be very careful and go for the uh, uh, ESD or if we have more margin and we can uh, do a piecemeal uh, EMR. So I think I'm with Sheila on this. And, uh, you know, I, I, I do think that piecemeal EMR if you're not suspecting submucosal invasion is a very reasonable option uh, you know, to be done. And in fact, we have five-year data on that, whereas we don't have five-year data on the ESDs that Ken and Sechiro are talking about. Doesn't mean that it isn't a reasonable alternative. I, I, I think in my opinion, uh, e either one of those uh, could be uh, you know, good alternatives, but I'm glad we all agreed that surgery is not the way to go. So. George, sorry, you're in the minority here today. So uh, I, I am glad I'm in minority here. Yeah, do that. So uh, last quick uh, question before uh, Sheila wraps it up is, uh, you know, Ken and Sachiro, you've done either an ESD or an EMR on a lesion, send it to histopathology, comes back with submucosal uh, invasion. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma. Uh, you know, the depth of invasion is about 50 to 75 microns. Uh, there is no lymphatic or vascular invasion. Uh, do you guys continue with endoscopic therapy or is this a patient you send uh, to George? Ken, very you, brief. Yes, no. Yeah, I, I, usually we have, a, we always have a discussion with a patient. They always see a thoracic surgeon. Uh, for possibility of esophagectomy. And usually because they have multiple comorbidities, uh, our tumor board will recommend just following, uh, continue with endoscopic therapy rather than esophagectomy. Uh, 
in okay. most cases, unless they're very, you know, there's other things. If they're very young, very healthy, sure. uh, and very worried, they might go to esophagectomy. Say Chiro. Yes, uh, his, his histology shows the deep submucosal invasions. Of course, uh, if the patient is a good surgical candidate, I would refer the patient to George. Okay, George? We discuss everybody with a submucosal resection. We discuss surgery with them and we tell them they have 15 to 20% incidence of lymph nodes metastasis. And if they can withstand surgery and agree, we offer them surgery. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, uh, final words oh, from uh, Sheila to wrap it up. Just before I wrap it up, Pratik, what, what I would do in this case is do endoscopic uh, ultrasound. Do a follow up every three months. And uh, once we have lymph nodes, you can always send the, the patient to surgery because there's such a high morbidity in his objectomy. Uh, yes, I would like to wrap it up. I would like to thank our excellent speakers, uh, Pratik, Sachiro. George and uh, Ken for this excellent session. We had great questions. Some of these will be answered by Facebook. Uh, the other thing I would like to tell our audience, uh, and we had over 200 of uh, registered participants. Uh, I would like to tell our audience uh, to save the date for our next virtual presentation, which will be on controversies on gastroesophageal reflux disease. And this will be on Wednesday the 18th of December, so mark your calendar. And I would like to thank everybody. I would like to thank the organizers for putting this together and uh, see you next time.